so we got on this because you've been talking about this for like four weeks. Yeah. I, I, I've been hung up in the book of Jonah. You know how well Jonah got, right? But I've been hung up in the book of Jonah. I've been, uh, I, I've read this story to the point that I pretty much can tell you the whole book of Jonah. Yeah, and I've, uh, I've not only read it in biblical form in several different dialects, not dialects, but in several different uh, versions. I've even read it in the children's book to my granddaughter. Wow. And you know, in that book, the story stuck out to me the most. And can I tell you why? I'll tell you why, because it reminded me of a lie that I heard as a child that's in the book. It stated that Jonah ran from God because he was fearful of God. And that's not the truth, as we'll uncover this later on in the story. I also realized that in this book, it showed a lovely little picture of Jonah in the belly of the whale. With a campfire. With a campfire. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, at least he was warm. <laughs> I bet that fish, though, he had heartburn. Uh, yeah, right? <laughs> Ooh, that male, that, that guy, we won't eat those again. Yeah. <laughs> those but, other people. But, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into this, in the beginning of that real quick, and I'm going to say something about that story. And the reason why that story stuck out so significant to me is because in the storybook, it's not biblical, I know. But in the storybook, it said Jonah was... Called a, God sent a word to Jonah and told him to go to, to Nineveh. And Jonah arrived and headed off to Nineveh. That's how the storybook said. He headed out to Nineveh and he came to a crossroads. I know that ain't biblical, but think about it. It's like what we do. The instant God's called us to something and something else pops up in front of us. Right? That has more significance to our flesh, mm. our, our heart. So Jonah was on the path according to this children's book. And a sign on the path said, Nineveh to the left, Joppa to the right. And Jonah thought, the ships that leave Joppa. I could go down to Joppa and get on a ship and go to wherever. Right? Jonah chose to go to Joppa. Yeah. So how often do we come for a face to face to those signs in our lives and allow our flesh to dictate what God is really wanting us to do? So this is good timing for us because a lot of you know that we're facing a decision of our own. It's either the road walking on water or the road that's stable and secure and solid and not so scary. And so we're in these, we all get there. And uh, we all get in those places, but we want to encourage you and those who will hear this later to, no matter what it takes, and we'll give more of this, I think, later on, but to show you what it looks like in the Bible. You guys know these stories, but we want to give you a perspective of they, how these people ran from God. Everyone has a call. Everyone has something, like I said earlier, something that God specifically picked for you to do, something that God dared to dream through you. He dares to dream through you. He's banking on it. He's banking on the scriptures that say you are pre, uh, predestined to do good things for him. He's banking on the fact that you will say yes and I do to the Lord. So do you know what your call is? Do you know what you're supposed to do? Even just in the season, you don't have to be you know everything but do you know and and if you uh if you do know do you know how to answer it do you know how to do it i mean i know some of you have prophetic and probably a lot of people on facebook or social media or wherever this goes have a lot of prophetic words spoken over them about um thank you about um what they're called to do and usually those are big pictures and you can't just jump in the big picture right and if you're a big picture person like me and you see the big picture and the big picture's over there and you're over here going, there's just, really? How are we going to get to the big picture? So you have to start taking it off in chunks, right? You can't keep running. You can jump in anytime you want to interrupt me. But I'm going to give uh, Romans 8.30 to start off about God having a plan to dare to dream through us. 
you know, I think that we wasted a good 20 years of, of what God had. I think when we came together, God had hoped we would have gotten it a lot sooner. Oh, I can guarantee you. I can guarantee you. If you would listen to me, that was if you were to listen to me, we wouldn't have probably missed all those 20 years. But I'm not going to burn you right here in front of everybody. So, moreover, <laughs> Romans 8.30, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, he also glorified. So i got to tell you, just I'm not going to do a whole theology around the scripture, I just want to show you something. If he made a decision about you before you were born, and something he wanted you to do, something he dared to dream through you, then this scripture tells you that he planned it, then he called you, then he justified you to be able to do it, and we're justified through the blood of Jesus, and then he also glorified. And that is because all of your glory that you gained for living out his dream in your life goes back to him one day, right? Mm -hmm. So you've been chosen before him to do something. You've been You've been called. So after he's made, some, everybody's been called. We're not listening. If we're not listening to the call, we won't. Hear. Mike always says, what's it you always say? I always, I always tell people, especially people that have walked yeah. away from the Lord or people that have, that have known the Lord in their life. And then all of a sudden I run into them and they'll say stuff like, I don't think it was no accident that we're talking today. Because I'm talking to them about God. I'm talking to them about the call that's on their lives. And a lot of times when God puts somebody back into your life that reminds them of the call or reminds them that they're a chosen generation or they're a chosen child and they have a call, they might have a call up on their life too. It could be a call of, it could be a healing. You could have a gift of healing. You could have the gift of, you could have gifts that God has in you that he's calling you out to use those gifts back into the body of Christ and you're stagnated because you're walking around with nobody speaking into your ear. They have to send, we need preachers that need to be sent out, right? As those preachers and prophets and evangelists are sent out into the world doing the worldly duty, duties, it wakes people up in, in life. Until you always say, I always tell them, listen, because if God's calling you, you will hear it again and this time answer them. Okay, so he said all that to say that. Okay. All right, we're doing it. We're gonna. We didn't practice this, by the way. We literally don't know what he's gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> it's up in the air. You know what that? Oh no, it's good. All right, so, but I want you to take this scripture. I want you to take Romans eight thirty. Please meditate on this scripture and look at those four words: predestined, called justified and glorified. So I looked at that today and I thought, yeah, God absolutely, in that one scripture, we see he absolutely planned and purposed it and he made it all okay for you to do. He made everything right for you to do. It's on our end that we have to answer. Then, of course, you know Jeremiah. Everybody knows Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. But how about through 13? For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. Just think about that. He promises. and if His promises are yes and amen from the beginning of the word to the end. Then it is this way for us. So if you're going to uncover the mystery that surrounds your calling and the plans and purposes for your life and the dream that God put in you, and around your life purposes, you have to seek God. You have to seek Him with your word. You have to hold the word to Him and say, Lord, I have no clue what you're saying. I need to hear you. And here's what your word says. These are your promises. I need you to speak to me. You have to know that He is a rewarder for to you. He will reward you. That's what the Bible says. He will reward you if you seek Him diligently. Right. I, I, want, to, I want to touch on this right here real quick. Because... God will also speak to the desires of our heart. He speaks to us through those desires. See, it was my desire to become, to, to work in law enforcement in some field. It was my desire. God, this, is, this has been my first platform to speak God's word daily. My first platform, my first podium. You know where it is? My first podium was... In law enforcement. Mm -hmm. My first podium. 
my first time I was able to bring people into a place of crying over the Lord was in there. It wasn't in here. It was in the workforce. It's when they're desperate. It's when we have desperate people. God could put us in place. I believe God called me to use me to glorify Him. And His first choice was to fulfill the desires of my heart so I can fulfill His. It's actually the backwards. It's the other way around. It's to, the, to, to fill the desires of His heart and mine will be fulfilled as well. Which is, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So your desire has to line up with what God's desire is. He will put his desire in you that can become your desire when you spend the time seeking him, right? Perfect. If we're stuck in the what ifs, though, if we're stuck in the world, we talked about this last night. Right. The things that we get stuck in. If we're stuck in the world, if we're stuck in routine, then the what ifs will speak louder than God's voice. Anybody? Absolutely. You know, you got to take a faith journey, and every time you take a step forward, the what ifs. We, we've we learned through this one thing that we're going through right now is to literally tune out the what ifs. Because we're well aware that there's a pile this big of what ifs, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's this big at least. And it's hard to get off your shoe. <laughs> So, we're not talking about that pile. Oh, that pile. That was, yeah, that, was, that was my pile today when I had to go out and clean up after your house. Anyway, so, but, the, but this pile is like, it's it, the what ifs are there. The what if, but what if, what if what God is saying that, that you do is to the obedience of Christ, if you do this one thing, what if what he's saying comes forth in a thousand blessings beyond yeah. like you talked about with the testing? All those things beyond this pile of what ifs. If, if your pile of what ifs is only this big, God's pile of what ifs you obey me is this big. Amen. So it's just really pushing past. And so we want to show you what happened. So you guys all know, um, I want to tell you this. I'm going to give you a little setup beforehand. Okay, almost every person was called according to God's, who was called according to God's desire ran or hid for some reason in the Bible. And you probably have, you, you may, you may have not thought about it like this, but all of them, everybody, either they didn't like what God wanted to do, or they didn't like what God wouldn't do. Some ran for fear and others out of unbelief that they were capable of fulfilling the assignment. And this is one I think, you know, from my heart has been fail, failure. What if I fail God? What if I fail? Not, not like me fail. Because I can fail, but what if I fail God? Or what if I take the word and don't preach it right? What if I err? These are my my what ifs. Sounds like Moses, right? So yeah, I what can't if speak right? What if I what if I can't do that? What if I fail? So when Jeremiah was called, listen to the conversation be between God and Jeremiah. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Jeremiah says this, and this is in the first chapter of Jeremiah. That the word of the Lord came to me, saying, "Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you." Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And that can take you back to Romans 8. He knew him first. Okay? Just like just like being predestined. He knew the plan first. So he knew Jeremiah first. I created you. So I called you to be just what I need you to be. Before you were born. And I sanctified you. Romans says I justified you. Because now we're justified through through Jesus' blood, but sanctified means setting apart. We're called to be set apart, to be holy. He says, so I sanctified you, Jeremiah, and I've ordained you to become a prophet. I did this, I did this, I did this. All you have to do is say yes to what I did. Yeah. Amen? Please hear that. All you have to do is say yes to what I did. But Jeremiah says, ah, ah, I can just imagine the trembling. Because right. I had that happen to me, so right. I definitely know when that call comes. And he says, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. Ooh, man, I could just feel that. But the Lord said, to, said, but the Lord said to me, "Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you to, and whatever I command you shall you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you, and I will deliver you." So He's already warned them. You're gonna get put. You're gonna get. You're gonna go through some junk, but I'm gonna deliver you. 
says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said, Be behold, I have put my words in your mouth. I want you to hear this. Did you hear what all God did? God did all of it. All Jeremiah had to do was say, I do. That's all he had to say. When God, that's all he had to do was say, I do. If you And if you remember in that, a little bit later on, in, in that chapter, a little bit later on, God actually told Jeremiah, I'm watching over my word to perform it. That's true. Which so, is a so God Don't was like his, up. God was coming right behind him with his hand right on his back. That's good. Okay, now look what happened when God called Isaiah. His complaint was that he had an unclean mouth. So you're in Isaiah chapter 6, and he said, Woe is me. How many of you ever say that? Just like that too. Woe is me. I'm so undone. All the drama and all of it, right? I do that. I, I do that before God. Is it the fake and cough? Come on, Ray, put it on. See, that's perfect. I, I know. So, he, so Isaiah is like, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The one, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand in it, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, your sin is purged. We've seen what God did again to prepare another person. Now these are just prophets, but we're or these are all prophets, but we're going to show you somewhere else where it's not just prophets. When the glory <laughs> fell in Isaiah's atmosphere, he recognized his sin and he cried out. That is the beginning yeah. of a call. The first time you can actually recognize you ain't all that. <laughs> really, honestly, we aren't all that. Amen. But God would do this anyway. You're not all that. Go ahead and say to your neighbor. I'm not, not all that. that. <laughs> You're not all that. <laughs> but you are awesome in God's sight. Just so I don't want to you know, want you cut each other down in here. So he recognized his sin and he cried out about his unworthiness. Okay, so we've got fear. I'm just a youth. And then we've got unworthiness. And uh, But God touched him, cleansed him. Who God calls, he sanctifies and justifies. Amen. So it's not for us to get called, this is such a good word for me, but he's just not, and you really need to receive this word. So, it's not, he calls us, and he makes it all good for us to go, and he starts to work you out like a clay, you know, like the pottery. He, that's where the pottery thing, the potter's wheel comes in. You're that clump of clay that said yes, because you can't speak because you're clay. So, <laughs> so the next thing we read is God saying, Look at this. And then the next thing is God saying, who shall we send? And Isaiah, after all this, not feeling worthy, <laughs> saw the glory of God and said, send me. I'll go. Wow. It's backwards with Isaiah. First the glory came, then the recognition of just how much I'm just not good enough. You see, when God's glory comes, it's face to face and you're face to face with the glory of God. You can't help but know your humanness. But the other thing you can't help but know is the love of God. Because it is the love of God that compels you to go out and do what he's asked you to do. Religion might start getting you motivated for a season, but eventually as the glory comes, you begin to see the religion is your motivator, or greed is your motivator, or whatever it might be. Whatever motivates us that isn't love. And the more he sanctifies us, the more he sets us apart, the more, I mean, the, the anointing is very strong up here. I'm literally having a hard time standing up. You don't go down? No, I'm good. I'm going to pray, I'm gonna pray for you. That would be so awesome. Right? Let's just lay Mike. Yeah. Um, I'll finish preaching. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway. <That's> lovely. <laughs> so, we see, we see that Jeremiah felt inadequate due to his age. And Isaiah clearly had something going on with his mouth, with his words. And, you know, out of the mouth, the heart speaks. So, something was going on with him. He says, I'm, I'm in, and I think it was Isaiah that later got in trouble again. And, uh, but where he had to deal with his sin again. And I was going to look that up to show you uh, what it was later on he did. Because, you know, the prophets were people. <clears throat> I read, was it Ezekiel? No, it was Elijah. Elijah actually had a disease that he was suffering from. And I've just seen this recently. I'm going to preach on it. Because I found that fascinating that Elijah had a double portion of the anointing oh, through Elijah. And he suffered with a disease. With a disease. Mm -hmm. 
See, they're just people, guys. They're, these people are real people that have real issues. Ezekiel's wife died. I mean, the, the, the desire of his eyes was taken from him, and he was died. And God said, basically, don't mourn her. We're going to show all these people what this looks like. To lose the, the, I mean, it was, I just read that this morning. It was actually pretty tough. So, the, the, these people were just people like you and me. The, you know, one day there's going to be a celebration of what you did when you picked up the call and you answered it. And you did it. Even if it's being a mom and you, you did the very best you could as a mom or a grandmother or whatever. We don't know. There's that one thing that God, one thing that God picks for us to be really excellent at. Right. It doesn't have to be religious. It's true. Yeah. Your job was to put up with me. Boy, was that a job. <laughs> <laughs> was it? No. But that was simple. Are you done? We're not done yet. You're making me sweat. <laughs> okay. If you have anything to say before I do a movie. No, see, I'm a, jo I'm a no person. I well, you know what? Down. I, what I want to say, though, is just because... I, I also want to bring back to us is that just because... We're not, we haven't answered the call yet. Doesn't mean God don't use us in the trials of our life. Oh, absolutely. And I'll explain that when I get to Jonah. Absolutely. So other people may pursue God, but in the middle of their calling, give up. Because the demonic assaults became, that's my thing, right? It just gets so bad sometimes. You just want to give up. You just want to yeah. walk away from it. But the, the assaults become more than they can bear, such as was the case with Elijah. Again, an extraordinary man of God. Extraordinary work that he did for the Lord. And you know, I think it's a little prideful, too. Because if you ever pay attention to the whole, you know, my God's bigger than your God scenario scene, it just kind of sounds like it. But anyway, after he boldly confronts Ahab and Jezebel, you guys know the story, having their false prophets of Baal killed, he runs. So it's possible that you're hearing this message and you're in the middle of your call. And something in life happens, and you just say, I'm just going to put this aside now. You can never lay the call aside. Yeah. Never. I'm going to tell you right now, if you ever think for a minute you can, you cannot. It will haunt you till the day you die. You can't lay it aside. I, 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 I wonder how people, as pastors, retire. Yeah, right. Yeah. How do you just go, okay, I'm not going to preach no more. I'm just quitting this. Because when I quit it, I get up in the morning and go to work. I preach all day long. I don't, yeah. I, maybe they you know, don't, maybe I they find somebody to. new. I meet somebody new. And next thing you know, I'm telling them about God. I'm telling them about Jesus. How do you lay down? I, I'm not going to talk about him no more. I'm retired now. <laughs> <laughs> How do we retire from a call? Maybe not everybody that, that's a pastor retires like that. Let me just check out. Okay. <laughs> Maybe they don't all retire that way. Let's hope not. Yeah. But look, let's look at First Kings nineteen one through four because it's you can feel the uh, the Lord, you can feel the anointing on the scriptures when you speak them out loud. You, they literally just release into the environment. So let's go there. Let's just let's just check this out. We're gonna look at that, and then we're gonna look at Acts nine, and then I think we're winding down with Jonah, right? Okay. So, and Ahab, if you're with me, First Kings nineteen one through four, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with a sword. So Ahab ran to the wife, and you're not going to believe what this guy did. And he just killed off all your prophets. What are you going to do about that? <laughs> Think about it. This is the scene. He just killed off all my wife's prophets, and she is going to be mad. Okay? So then Jezebel sends a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw, and I've preached this countless times before because it's really important, especially because images, the Bible talks about taking down vain imaginations. This is what got planted in Elijah, a vain imagination, empty threats. Because God had Elijah. But when you see a threat, when you see the fear, it burns in your imagination. And so that's how this hit him. And so it says, and when he saw that, the threat, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey. So he's not even alone. He has somebody with him. He goes on a day's journey into the wilderness and come and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. 
And he said, it's enough, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Something in this whole deal made him feel like he failed. So when you get when you come down a lot, I've experienced this a lot preaching. I know a lot of preachers do too. You come down off the anointing, and the first thing you hear is every negative thought that could come your way. How you I didn't you do well today. Yeah. I messed up. You missed. You know, and it goes on and on. And so, I mean, we know that from this story that you just talk, talked about is is it's remarkable to me. Because it, can you imagine slaying that many people? As a man, I guarantee you well, that was... all those people to do it with him. Right. I mean, they he was, him. It, and it had to be a bloodbath. And when he was done, he knew he conquered. And you know they didn't go by, they just didn't willingly give up their life. It was a fight. It was a fight. And because a woman threatened him... He ran like a dog with his tail between his legs. A woman threatened him. We're going to talk about this later. A woman threatened him, though. Think about it. And he, and then the vision hit him, and it locked him up. Or could it be from some of the trauma that he was also visually from the... He was weak. Exactly. In, in, in spirit, right? He was weak. From the trauma that he might have witnessed of all of those slaughters. So when you come out of a battle or out of a season of dryness or out of a season of really strong warfare, you have to rest. And you can still be in the warfare while you rest. There's a way to rest in God and still be getting things done and still be warm. But if yeah. you don't rest in this in the trials and tribulations that you go through in life, I mean it could be this. Here's an example. Say you're going through a marriage trouble. Okay, this is a really tough place in your life, and it's just this tumultuous battle on and on and on. And you're, say you're praying for your spouse to just come to the Lord and to get delivered or whatever it is that you're praying. You're in a battle at that point. Can I just tell you, the moment you're praying for your spouse for a, 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 an endangered marriage, mm. you are in warfare. And so you may not really recognize it, but it can really wear you down. And then all you need is one more hit sideways out of nowhere that just goes on top of that. Or maybe you're worrying for your child. Maybe you're worrying for a, a, you know, a, a prodigal or something or whatever. But either way, when you pray those kind of prayers to bring somebody back to the Lord, those are warfare prayers. I think every one of you, I know you all, every one of you in here have somebody like that that you now need today to remind yourself, hey, I've been in war for this person. I need to get refilled. I need to get blessed. I need to get rest. Mm -hmm. Think about that. You might not feel like you're in warfare because you're not yelling, screaming, and hey, devil, get out my face. <laughs> but you are as you pray and you call up for God to do something. So lastly, on my end is Paul, who was once Saul. Like you were Mike and now you're Michelle. <laughs> oh, no. This is Michelle and I am Ernie. And we fit right into the society today. <laughs> oh, no. You know, it's like it's, I, we mess the doctor's offices all up. I'm not kidding you. Like the way his name is spelled. I wish my name was Bert. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Yeah, so, Mikkel, he was Michael for a long time to the sheriff's department, said now you got to use your real name and the real spelling of it, so it's spelled like Michelle. So now the whole world knows, because everybody on Facebook knows it too. Uh, but know. this is good, now you're free. Uh, this is, this uh, is so good. Uh, uh, <laughs> a girl named Sue, no, a boy named Sue. Right. That's right, a boy named Sue. Like you ever know that song? Jim. You know that song, you want to name it? You want to sing it? Go ahead. No. <laughs> Alright, so, so last on my list of runners is Saul. And I, I'm wondering how many times have we looked at Saul, mm -hmm. the Apostle Paul, as a runner. Have you ever thought about this? I'm going to give you a couple things to think about here. This is what came to me as we were talking about it. We're going to go to Acts chapter 9, 1 through 9. And we're going to look at Saul's turning conversion, his, the day he stopped kicking against the Goads. <laughs> I didn't put that in here either. So we That's probably scripture. should include that. It is scripture. We should include that in part, but I didn't. Okay, so we're ready? Then Saul, this is what is so amazing to me, because this is one of those suddenlies. And I think Mike and I are about to encounter a suddenly in our lives as well. I think God's going to start doing a lot of suddenlies. We know of some in the room. There's suddenlies. All of a sudden, bam, you went from this to that, and here you are. And it happened so quick and unexpected. And so here's Paul, Saul at the time. 
verse 1, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found anyone, any believer, who were of the way, whether they were men or women, he could care less, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he's carrying a verdict in his hand. He has an assignment against God's people from the, from the God Yahweh, right? That's who he's believing he's talking to. That's the Jewish God, and he is a Jew, okay? And as verse, verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, now you get that, why are you persecuting me? Because every time he persecuted God's people, he's persecuting God. Jesus. So he says, why are you persecuting me? And Paul says, who, Saul says, who are you, Lord? With a capital L. He recognizes. He has to recognize, because he's not calling him a little L Lord. He's calling him a big L Lord. Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the Goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Trembling and astonished, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. So this encounter happened with others. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. You guys need to realize that the very same God that he was worshiping was the same God who sent Jesus Christ. His God, his Abba Father, that, that God that Paul Saul was worshiping was the same God he was persecuting. Okay, it's the same, the same God that sent Jesus Christ as the Messiah, yet he did not recognize Jesus as the prophesied Messiah. The same God that he worshiped had to blind him to get him to answer the call. This is his God. I don't know if you're catching this, but this was such an intimate connection with me last night when the Lord showed me this. I am that God that he was talking to. I am that God. See, this is what happens when, when it, I'm going to use the Jewish people for example, they're worshiping the same God. This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is our Abba Father. We are part of that numerous sand. The numbers as big as the, the sand, as much as the sand and as much as the stars. Think about that for a minute. Now I want to take you someplace really quick before we go into Jonah. Just real quick because I feel like the Lord wants you to think about this. How many times have we unwittingly persecuted the very same God that came to save us by refusing or by choosing something outside of his will and we have persecuted him. We've come against his people. We've come against the anointing. We've come against the plans. And I can't, I can't get the whole picture here. Obviously, God's going to give me a download on this. I can feel it coming. But what got me with Paul was that he's talking to his Abba Father who he thinks he's got letters in his hand to kill people. Who, was, who Jesus came to save. He's got, he's, that's a religious spirit. Mm -hmm. See, the, the letter kills. Mm -hmm. This is the religious spirit. Think about the letters he has in his hand. It's a sword of religion. Mm. He had not been converted. He had not even opened his eyes to the very scriptures he was perfected in. Right. Mm. I mean, that's pretty intense. Yeah. Oh, that's for another night. So oh. I won't... Uh, I won't, but it's just something to think about because there is a religious spirit and it does get us to do things completely against our Savior unwittingly we don't know it a lot of times we're holding I mean I, I can give you an example this happened recently where some somebody is getting prayer and they're just constantly being pointed at pointed at pointed at by the religious voice that says get over it you just got to love these people and that will change your situation when over here on the other side, it really was, well, this person needed to be loved too, and the Father needed to heal them so that the love could be released. Because sometimes you're bound in hurts and wounds and pains, and when religion comes by and says, get over it, you just need to love that person. It's all about your fault. Never mind what you've been through. Never mind how much you've tried prior. If that doesn't matter because the letter of the law is love. And that's a lie because the letter of the law is not love. Love is love. God is love. The letter of the law is law. law yeah. 
Amen. Good word. Yeah. It was good. All right, your turn. Yeah. And now Chiway, you want me to well, see my notes? Look at that. Okay, you, you you'll be lost in the blue blues. Through them all. Yeah. You'll be all lost. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's talk about well, you know, I'm, I want to run through it. I'm going to run through Jonah, but I'm going to run through it even. Uh, I'm going to talk about what Jonah touched on. And, and even though Jonah was running, what happened during the running that actually brought people to Christ? Or to God. Or to God. Okay. I'm sorry. For one, Jonah was. It, it talks about how Jonah was called. To go to Nineveh, Jonah jumped up and went away from Nineveh. We weren't really clear on why he did this in the beginning of the book. It doesn't really give you the basis of why he did it until the fourth chapter of Jonah. Right? So, he runs off and goes gets on a ship and runs to Tarsha to get away from to get away from God. He was running from God. Not running because he didn't know God. Jonah knew God. Jonah was a prophet. Jonah was a, 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 a Hebrew. He was a prophet. So he knew God's voice. He knew when God spoke. There's not a lot of history on Jonah. This might have been the only thing God called him to do. But he was called to go to Nineveh. When Jonah decided to jump on the ship, God sent a mighty wind up on the ocean. The ocean got so rocky that Jonah, he wasn't afraid, he wasn't a fearful man like the storybook says, and how I believed growing up that he was just a fearful man of God. I believed he was a fearful man of God running from God. And we're going to find out here in a minute that he wasn't. If Jonah was a fearful man of God, he wouldn't have fell asleep on the ship that was bust, getting ready to be busted up. The people that were on the ship was the sailors that came to Jonah and asked Jonah. They were all fearful of their lives, and they started praying to their own gods. Right? Every man on the ship was praying to his own God. Jonah was asleep. When the captain found him asleep in the bottom of the pit, he woke Jonah up and told him, What are you doing sleeping? Rise and pray to your God because he might have mercy upon us and spare our lives. Then the sailors got together and drew lots and the lot fell against Jonah. Right? Then they went to Jonah and said, Who are you? Where do you work? And what do you do? And Jonah done told them that he was running from God in the beginning. That's why he came onto the ship. He told them, they said, Well, why would you do that to us? Right? How are we to correct this problem? And Jonah said, Throw me overboard. Throw me into the sea and the sea will calm. Now, if Jonah was fearful, wouldn't want them to do that. <laughs> right? I think he was a little on the suicidal side, though. Oh, he was a little <laughs> bent. He was a little bent. He was a typical prophet that was crying, weeping, mad. You don't get a whole bunch of email from the prophets and I'm not going to answer. I'm going to direct them to your personal email. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a lot of this, but I know a lot of you know the story. But Jonah told him, throw me overboard. The men reluctantly did, and didn't want to. Matter of fact, they tried to paddle the boat back to shore. Couldn't do it. The waves grew worse and worse. Then they cried out to God and said, forgive us for taking this man's life. And they threw him overboard. The seas grew calm. And then what did they do? Those men on the ship yeah. brought a burnt offer or brought an offering to God and brought vows to the Lord 
and vowed with him. Some versions say that they submitted their lives to Christ, to the Lord from that day forward. So their salvations in there was a salvation of all of those men on the, that ship that gave his, gave their lives to the Lord that day, even though Jonah wasn't answering a call. So God took that situation and used it to bring glory back into him. I think it's important to note that that Jonah wasn't just running from orders, he was running from the presence of God. There was There is a fear and a trembling when the call comes. When that thing comes to us. That's, that kind of, that's true. I mean, when, whenever she was truly called, I remember how fearful it seemed that she was. I mean, she just, I don't think that that's what I'm supposed to be doing. It, it was a hard thing for her to do. Sort of like what I'm going through right now. I'm going through some stuff for myself right now. And it's, it's hard. And it might be, the simple fact is when I step out, God's going to lay an anointing up on me if he hasn't already started that's going to break the yoke of bondage. So, so the, the, uh, I just noticed that, listen to this, I just noticed in all the stories that we told us, sorry, rabbit trail, but the presence of God came in every single time. The presence of God came. Okay, we saw it with the light, we saw it with Isaiah, we saw it with Jeremiah, and, and, Obviously, with a call this big that burdened Jonah so much, somewhere was the presence of God in this encounter with him. And we see it in verse 4, too, when he has the whole vision thing and right. that whole breakdown. So the presence of God is with him. It's important that we also understand that the presence of God is with you when you go out to do that thing he told you to do. When you go out, no matter what it is, if he said to do it, we have got to become people who go, okay, God said to do it, he'll take me through it. No matter how scary it is, no matter how uncomfortable it is, no matter how much it's going to cost me, he's going to do it. You know, there's coming up on some of our lives, I keep saying this, that seasons of giving up everything is going to happen more and more at ways that we don't really comprehend at this point what he's preparing us for giving up certain things to do the next thing. And it's always going to look illogical to the world. We definitely know that from something we're looking at doing, that it looks absolutely illogical because God's not logical like man is logical. It wasn't logical for God to send this prophet into Nineveh who really did look like a town that needed to be wiped out. I mean, talking, they're very similar to a Sodom and Gomorrah. That's who Nineveh was. If you hadn't studied out how bad Nineveh was and, the st and just what kind of nasty people they were, they had actually been through two or three droughts and still did not relent. So, you know, the funny part about this is God commanded a fish to swallow Jonah. He stayed in the belly of that well for three days and three nights. Then you know what he had to look forward to? Come well puke. <laughs> I don't want to be that low. Could have been out the other end of that. Man. That's he right. Done. He wouldn't have that would have been down. really low. <laughs> Can you imagine? But, you know what? He said, well, he, he, God commanded the well to vomit him up on the dry land. I didn't know I'd ever use, I'd use that word. During this message. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I love it. So, the sailors came to the Lord, right? He got, I think he gets, I think he gets a, I don't think Once I he know. cleans all the slime off of himself, I think he gets a crown and a little jewel. jewel in because he ran him. and people... No, but it goes to show you that even in your bad choices, good things can come out of it. Absolutely. Right? I think Jonah loves God. I think he just had a predis predisposition towards self-righteousness to a degree, in my opinion. Well, Jonah, Jonah was asked again by the Lord to go to Nineveh. I guarantee you I would have been running. I wouldn't even have to wait. He wouldn't have had to tell me once I was vomit, I'm going to get up and run. <laughs> so then what happened? So then he went to right. Nineveh. So, so the Lord, so the storyteller. Yeah, I am a storyteller. <laughs> so the Lord called him to go back to Nineveh for the second time. He went back to Nineveh. Nineveh was such a large city that it takes three days to walk across it. So he walked a day's time into it, 
and then started announcing that it's going to be overthrown in 40 days as he walks out of Nineveh. It's going to be overthrown in 40 days. He had an attitude. The people in Nineveh believed him and started, and started repenting. They said, let neither man nor beast, the kings oh, and the nobles said, let, let neither me. man nor beast, herd nor flock, yes. taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, man and beast wow. be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way, and from the violence that is in his hands, who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Can I go on to this one? Go ahead. And then God saw their works, and uh, and they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. And it does go to prove that repentance can cause God to pull his hand of discipline off. It absolutely right. can work. And this was and this was a culture that repented. So they repented for their... Their, their junk as an entire culture as well. And that's what made Jonah mad. And Jonah's reply to that was, isn't this what I said back in my country? This is what Jonah's running from. Because he knew God was a gracious God. He knew God was a God that, of, of kindness and loving God that isn't going to bring wrath on somebody if they repent. Right. So this is Jonah 4.2. So he prayed to the Lord and said, uh, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Think about that for a minute. How many times have you seen people be blessed that you know darn well in your opinion did not deserve it? Oh boy. The Bible says God's kindness can draw us to him. Yeah. Now, I don't know how that works, quite frankly, because I haven't met anybody who understood that kindness was God, not thinking it was their own self making it. But but that's that's what he's saying. Your kindness, your your even the idea to people that if you repent and turn away, then God's gonna pull off his hand. This was really I see this as self righteousness. He knows better than God. But he knows God wants to save and wants to bless. And this kind of goes into our journeys. God wants to bless us. Amen. And if people could just understand or understand the things that we've had to learn, I've had to learn, that God is not a God that's always mad at us, always out to get us. And a lot of us were raised to believe that. But he actually does want to bless us. And that's why we do deliverance. That's why we get things out of the way of our lives so we can make room for God's abundant blessings. Is we get those things out of the way. So I don't know if you... I have uh, Jonah 4, 1, 3, and 4 was this... Yeah, go ahead. Let me finish it up. But, okay, so Jonah, if you want to see the end result, is in Jonah 4, 1, 3, and 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Verse 3. Some of you guys who know this story as children are going, oh, I did not catch that. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord says, is it right for you to be angry? You'd rather die than to live? We saw that also with Ezekiel. You know, the prophets are under a lot of pressure. Amen. I'm going to tell you about a prophetic person or the prophet's call. They have to be in such a place with God that they can see sin to the intensity of how it should be judged and yet love people to the intensity that God wants them to love. You want to know why most prophets are schizophrenic? God calls the schizophrenic to be a prophet. It's just saying. That's how he does it. Well, and, it's, and it's really hard. It's really hard whenever the prophetic wants to speak the straight truth and the, the right to the and point. Without the love. And you got people over here that just, oh, we just need to punch love. Just need that love. Why are you so hard? Right? And you got these people over here. It's like, give it to me. <laughs> right? Some people like so to get that. It's it's really hard. Uh, that's why we need a pastor. <laughs> uh, yeah. That can that can love on the people <laughs> across the board and still sometimes have a heavy hand in certain areas that need to be a little bit heavier. So I've I put these questions to put this to test and how to apply this. So how do we apply this? How do we take what we just learned tonight from all of these prophets and from Apostle Paul, who was an apostle, he was very prophetic, he was anointed, 
Maybe he, he probably ventured in and out of prophet, but, but he was an apostle because I wanted you to see some different calls. There were other calls in the Bible. Now you can kind of look for them yourself. But how do you apply this? These were the questions that came to my mind. So what is it going to get, take to get you to respond to God in faith and do whatever he asks so you can fulfill your purpose and his dreams? So that's one your question. Your purpose and his dreams. Your purpose and his dreams. What will it take in this season if indeed something's going on in your life? Maybe not everybody's going through something. But what if you're at that precipice where things are about to shift over into a new opportunity and you're just, you can't, you got to open your eyes. See how what you if? are. <laughs> so, are you ready to stop believing that you know more about your ability than God? Oh. That's good. This is one of my yeah, This is one that the Lord gave. Of course, that zinged right back at me. One, that one did too. So, so there's so that's one finger with four pointing. So we got that. But did you hear me? What are, are you ready to stop believing? You know more about God. You know more about your ability than God does. Ooh, that's a good one. I like it. Are you ready to stop? Are you ready to stop running in fear of the what ifs? Because let me tell you, God called Peter to walk on the water, right? Come on out here. Let's do this. You know what he did with Peter? Think about this. Peter's the only one that we know of that actually walked on water for a moment. He got a joy ride with Jesus like nobody has ever had before. <laughs> because he was willing to get out and take a chance. Right? That's what, that, that's the exciting part about walking with God. Once you get over giving up sin, once you get past all that junk, and you're like, glory to God, I don't have to do that. I'm not hooked there anymore. Now you get to go on these amazing faith walks with Jesus. They're worth it. They really are worth it. We're, I know because we're in one right now, so that's how come I'm speaking to me. You know my words are going out and back in, right? Okay, so are you willing to stop being self-righteous? I'm not talking to any of you. This is not the other side. And give in to the will of God, even when you think you know better. I mean, we've been there. I've been there. Maybe y'all have never been there. But are you willing to fulfill what God started in your life, knowing that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion? And lastly, are you ready to forgive God for not giving you the life you thought you were supposed to have? I like to get people on that kind of stuff because it does make you think for a minute, forgive God for not giving me the life. And then you start to realize, yeah, I kind of did hold God hostage a little bit to all those things I did not get. If we don't kill that thing, it's going to look like the Holy Ghost with the eye that was an angel. <laughs> it's going to look like an angel. I an angel just flew by. So, so I want you to think about those questions. And I don't know if we can... Um, we're just going to we're gonna take communion. So how about we use these questions as... Uh, some means to pray through tonight together as a as a family. You know, if you've got anything pegged, you know, jumped out at you, that these are things you want to get prayer for, if there's something holding you back, what do you think? Did I get it? Okay. All right. Well, look at us. One final, one final question.